going to say a few words. I've got a prepared statement, and then we're going to jump into a little conversation. Um, so for those of you that, that knew her, uh, I mean, not only was his life intertwined with the literary life of San Francisco, I mean, he was, I think, really the living embodiment of San Francisco's North Beach. And I think watching Herb over the years, I mean, coming to City Lights, buy his New York Times, browse the stacks, um, he kind of embodied the kind of an ethos. Um, he was really kind of like a signifier of, of, of North Beach. And, and it really kind of ties in, I think, to, to the, you know, not just the beats, but even going back as far as like even Bohemia. And I know that Herb would be like, ugh, Bohemia, you can't say that about me. But, but I mean, in a good way. I mean, in, in the sense that, yeah, he had it more together than a lot of other poets or writers. But, but still, like the spirit in which he lived, I think was really kind of exemplifies those ideals. Um, joining us today is Ari Gold, his, his son. Um, he's a film director, a poet, a musician. He's founder and president of Grack Films. Uh, his films have been screened at Sundance, Telluride, hundreds of other festivals. Uh, he's won numerous honors for his work. His most recent film in the works is a companion to the book that we're celebrating tonight. It's called Brothers, Brother Versus Brother. So he's got a wonderful website you should all check out. Uh, <coughs> produced several wonderful films. Um, as I said, Ethan could not be here, but he was a songwriter. He's a performer, a producer, a ranger. Um, and uh, our heart kind of goes out to him. We love him very much, and we uh, hope he's doing well. Um, he's coming up with a uh, trilogy of albums, actually, you should all check out. They're called uh, Earth City. So I want to remind everybody, we are going to be going over to the Subio Cafe after this to do a signing. Please purchase your books at City Lights first. Just walk right in, pick up a copy, and then come on into Vesuvio's, and we'll be kind of hosting a signing there. So a few words about Herb. Um, he was born on March the 9th, of course, in 1924, <coughs> in the Cleveland, Ohio suburb of Lakewood to a Russian Jewish family. He moved to New York City at the age of 17 after several of his poems had been accepted in several New York literary magazines. He studied philosophy at Columbia University, and it was there that he met members of the Beat Generation. And this resulted in a lifelong friendship with Allen Ginsberg, uh, a less than friendly relationship with Jack Carroll, <laughs> whom Herb was very suspect of from the beginning. But maybe we can talk a little bit about that later. Um, his studies were interrupted during World War II, where he served in the Army. Uh, after the war, he graduated from Columbia with a BA and an MA, and on a Fulbright scholarship, attended classes at the Sorbonne in Paris at approximately the same time as Lawrence Ferlinghetti. So I am certain that they probably crossed paths at some point. Uh, but think about this. He was in Paris at the same time that Richard Wright was there, that James Baldwin was there, Saul Bellow. So he's like immersing himself in the literary life at a very, very early age. Um, and he finished his first novel in Paris. So over the years, Herb moved around the world, writing as he traveled. He lived in Haiti for a period of time, wrote a book about it. Uh, he's even been in places like Detroit. He eventually settled here, wonderfully, where he became embedded in the literary scene, as I mentioned. In 1958, he taught English at Cornell University, where he was Vladimir Nabokov's successor. And that's an interesting little factoid. Um, a lot of Herb's work is about relationships. It's about the human condition. And uh, Herb was married twice. First to the writer and professor Edith Zubrin, with which he had two children, Anne and Judith. And he was later remar to remarry to Melissa Dilworth, who sadly passed away in a very tragic helicopter crash. And we'll talk a little bit about that later. Uh, they had two children. Three. 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 Oh, sorry. Three. Three. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Lena! <Yay. laughs> <laughs> so, Herb you are on the website. Yeah, uh, Herb has been a prolific writer, writing over two dozen books, four collections of short fiction. He's also a poet, and City Lights had the great honor of having him read at our 70th 
anniversary celebration in Kerouac Alley over the summer. This was actually to be his final event with us, sadly. But uh, tonight, we kind of hope to use this new book as a kind of a lens to really think about you know, Herb's life, but also really it's about a relationship between father and sons. Um, so I'm going to jump right into it right now. Are right, you welcome? Thank you. And congratulations. And that is really a beautiful package, might I say? Like I said earlier, it's <laughs> the kind of book I would like see on a shelf and be like, yeah, I'll take that. Uh, but moreover, I think that what you and your brother and your your dad have kind of done here, um, the way that you're very fortunate to be able to connect, and especially during the pandemic, which I mean, I know we've all been through quite a bit, and to have a chance to really kind of use the pandemic as a moment to kind of connect. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the genesis of the project, I mean, and how that kind of came to be, and you know, and how you got your, your brother involved as well. Uh, thank you for the lovely introduction, and um, I know that you're gonna become completely obsessed with my sister Nina and everything that she does and everything that she's accomplished. Um, of all of our dad's children, she was clearly the best, the most talented, the most attractive, uh, and the smartest, sorry. And, um, but, um, <laughs> Well said. <laughs> well said. It's making up for, making up for a. Thank you. Because now Ian's looking at me. Because well, he he mentioned you on stage. She was the one who was neglected on stage. So I'm making up for it by doubling down. Okay, Anne is the actually Anne is the most intelligent <laughs> and brilliant. Um, well, the, I mean, this is actually, you know, he had five children. And um, there's a lot of relationship and a lot of love and a lot of learning that um, the thing that was so inspiring to me about, well, when I think about him objectively, is that even into his late 90s, he was willing to challenge himself and, and do the best within who he was to have a deeper relationship with us and um, literally to the last day, to the last hour, and, and uh, we were all, all there with him. And um, this is a rare thing because uh, so many, I mean, I, I, I'm sure a lot of people in this room have relationships with people in their lives or family members who calcify and refuse to change. And you know you can't teach an old dog new tricks, um, but our dad was somebody who um, wasn't perfect. He had, you know, he was an amazing storyteller, but not such a great listener sometimes. Um, and um, and yet, even to the age of ninety nine, he was willing to challenge himself to hear us better. Ironically, even when his ears and his eyes stopped working. And in some ways, as his ears and his eyes stopped working, he was forced to listen to us in a different way. And, and we can all attest to the, the fact that he, he kept trying to connect in a, in a, in a deeper way. Uh, I'm not sure if that's the question. I, I'm answering the question you asked. Or what was the question? Well, the genesis, the genesis. Oh, right, right. Sorry. The genesis of the book. I get back in the beginning. I'm starting at the end. This is... Kurosawa style, I'm giving you the ending and then you can see all the different ways it comes across. Um, so, yeah, during uh, when COVID started, um, I was working on some film projects. I was trying to get off the ground. My brother was working on some music projects. We we're both down in LA and we had very recently started writing poetry with a group down there where we would meet in someone's living room. I think we'd only done it once or twice. And uh, the person who was leading it would would do something like, you know, pull a book off the shelf and say, walk too much, just to, uh, you know, take a few words randomly. And then based on whatever she picked, 
we would have four minutes with a timer to write a poem. And then we would read to each other. And it, that way of writing forces you away from the editor mind, the, the left brain, the left brain, you know, the kind of logical mind. You, you go into a, into a different way of creating and it was wonderful to have this little group and we would sh read with, to each other and share and even when somebody said, oh, I, I didn't do anything good, that was terrible, we'd say, read it, read it anyway and they would start reading it and there would always be at least one phrase that was glorious that they wouldn't have thought of if they had been thinking logically. So that, you know, being forced to write something somehow inspired by a couple of random words brought about a, a kind of impulse of creativity. So this was a few weeks before the pandemic and suddenly lockdown happens and the group decided to meet on, on Zoom and continue. And I very quickly got kind of obsessed and started doing it on my own time every day and I started posting poems on Instagram. Um, and there were people in other countries who were saying, you're inspiring me to keep create during this strange time. And I was getting, you know, not a lot of fan mail, but I was getting kind of fan mail online from people who were inspired by what I was doing, but why, what, what this group was doing. Meanwhile, our dad, who had taught us to write and taught us to care about language, was up in San Francisco and being told that he couldn't talk to anybody and he was a person who loved social life. He couldn't, you know, he was being told he shouldn't buy bananas in Chinatown, he shouldn't leave his house. I mean, we know the story of what happened, but this is somebody who thrived on human connection and he also thrived on writing and so at the same time that he was being told not to leave his house, he couldn't see his typewriter keys anymore. He was you know, he'd normally every morning he would go out to a coffee shop and flirt with whoever was serving him coffee and then go home, you know, jacked up on coffee and write for a few hours on his typewriter, his manual typewriter. Now he couldn't do either of those things. And I was worried about him and sad for him and thinking, you know, I'm, I have this community because of, frankly, because of the digital world, I was able to keep connecting. Um, and he doesn't have that, and I, w I, was, I was concerned for him. So I started sending him my poems, and I would include an envelope with a stamp, you know, the <laughs> self-addressed stamped envelope, and I was put in big letters, write something, write anything, send it back to me. And I did this a few times, and then I started getting piles back from him. Um, and. So that was the genesis of, of the book. Um, and I know, and then later on, uh, Ethan also sort of joined it. And I, I wasn't in, in on you, but you, had, you also at some point sent him poems too, right, Anne? I wasn't in on that until, until later. But, but Ethan and I were like, you know, hammering him to write. And um, so, that, that's how it all happened. Were there personal revelations for you during the process and, and for your brother um, as you were kind of going through old materials? And, and, and were you surprised? And we, I know we talked earlier about Hodorowsky and how you've, you've worked with Hodorowsky. You're very interested in his work. And I, I can see this almost as being a, a kind of an exercise that, that, that he would, you know, like perhaps suggest, but maybe it came to you, you know, unconsciously. But, but if you could talk to that maybe a little. Well, uh, yeah, so th those who know Hodorowsky's work, um, well, those who don't actually, is a filmmaker, and, but also can, does a kind of shamanism form of art where he pushes people to go into their traumas. And so I'm making a movie based on a ritual that he has asked me to do, and that movie has been taking <laughs> 10 years so far to make. So, but I was certainly thinking about this idea of, can you go back in time and rewrite traumatic events? Can you rewrite relationships through art? And so 
that was on my mind as this started to develop and, and the notion from you know the notion of my relationship to my dad specifically about masculinity um, specifically about what I learned well from him and what I learned badly from him became for me kind of the the main thread of what I was writing and what whether he knew it or not he was sending me felt and felt like you know and that's where the title came up of, of this this idea of you know he he wasn't macho but he had a very specific way of seeing the way men should be and um, that had a huge influence on his daughters but it had an influence on his sons in a different way and so I wanted to focus on that um, you know how we deal with love how we deal with what it means to be a man how we deal with our relationships with women that um, that uh, inheritance is the subject of the book and, and that's what pretty quickly came out for me in what I was receiving from him where I was like the way he would reveal stuff in his poetry about his you know sexy dreams he was having at age 98 <laughs> you know, that you know he may not have sent to you guys yet but you know it's here it is um, <laughs> so, but you know he was he was the poetry was definitely the poetry to sons and for for better and for worse you know and um, so Again, I've forgotten if that's answering your question. Yeah. Did I answer the question? Yeah. Was there a question? Uh -huh. No. Roughly. My uncle is not so sure. <laughs> well, well, you know, we're, we're honoring him, so I think anything that kind of emerges at this point, it's, it, for me, I, I found that there was something reassuring about her. Like, whenever he come into City Lights, and, and I can't quite put my finger on it, but it was almost like my blood pressure would drop a little bit. And he'd, like, crack a silly His joke. would go up. But, yeah, maybe. <laughs> but, you know, mine would go down. And you'd crack a silly joke or something or inquire about Lawrence or, you know, but, but the, 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 the constancy of, of, you know, like the, the coffee shop, picking up the times, browsing the stacks and what have you, and, you know, but then also there's the work itself. And a lot of it is about human relationships. And do you have, now that you've finished this book, Looking back at the Uber, I don't know you, how many of them you've read, but I mean, you have some idea about what you know what he was writing about. Uh, how do you reflect back on all that work after this? Um, the work of this, or the work well, of his entire life, which is well, a lot. Yeah, the, the, the arc uh, of his, you know, career. Well, um, yeah. So he used to say that he was a failed poet. Um, or sometimes he would say that, but he didn't say that very often, but occasionally he, he would say that. And certainly when we talked about poetry, that's how we talked about it. Uh, because he had, when he was 17, sent some poems off to uh, various periodicals. And, it, and he, I, he, as far as I know, he did get one poem published. It was a one, I think, when he was 17, uh, before he'd gone to Columbia. Um, and then he became really embarrassed by poetry and um, you know developed his own style as a as a prose writer that um, you know was muscular post-war you know we know the style of writing that that existed at the time and, and he was a, a leader in some ways in terms of his kind of um, witty and nimble prose but that was definitely not sentimental and um, and it wasn't until he was in his 90s that he reconnected with poetry. So there's, I, I think, something lovely about this coming out now. We had, of course, intended for him to be here today, uh, that, and so that would have been a, a different thing. But but uh, that his first published piece was a poem, and I guess his last published piece is, is a poem, is or is poetry. Uh, that is a full circle thing. I, I would like everyone to have a taste of, of the work. And so, but we're going to also have room for questions. So please be thinking about, you know, just 
Also, any of your experiences, you know, with with her? Um, so I'm sure many of you, you know, over the years. So if you could maybe read some excerpts. Sure. Now, it's my first time seeing the book, um, which was a very, very intense period of many months designing it, and the. Um, the end pages are missing, so I'm just, just sort of processing my <laughs> my sadness. The most beautiful photos have been replaced by red, but you know, you guys can email me and I'll send them to you. Um, but I did consider this to be a not just a book of words. I wanted it to be an experience of um, of a life um, with pictures too. I guess you know I'm a filmmaker, so that's natural to me. But, you know, I was always talking about book design with my dad. Um, so, okay, so I think I will read, um, I think a nice pair, because this is, you know, it's set up like a dialogue. I'll read a pair of poems that my father and I wrote about his father. Okay. This is from Herbert Gold, my father in our city of Cleveland. That strange foreign father hardly spoke as he ate his cholesterol. Mother said, Sam, drink your citrus. It's good for your body. But he preferred chicken skin fried with onions, a taste carried from the old country. And oh, it was good, even in the new country best for his soul. I loved it too. We shared something. But I was different from him, preferred my gribbon on toast. In the new country, which mother called our city of Cleveland, this cholesterol was good for us both. On a Sunday afternoon, the newspaper cast down by his chair, my father would blink, rise, saying, let's go for a walk in our city of Cleveland. And avid, I jumped up. We walked, my father mostly silent, studying the houses for rent signs, for sale signs, and then said, that's enough. We went home. To the house where sunk in the stuffed chair, he picked up their tog, or the Cleveland News. If I interrupted him, he grunted, or in a generous mood, sighed, and offered me the single column in English, so, uh, sorry, to the left on the front page of their tog. Did I spell that correctly? I know no Yiddish except his few words to mother, such as, put the kids to bed in our city of Cleveland. When I asked mother why he talked so little, why he didn't talk to me, she explained, but he's a good provider. I hardly knew him. Perhaps he grunted other words. I now believe he grunted some, perhaps to me when I slept, or to himself when we quarreled, which meant, I love you. Sometimes I believe it. Perhaps I should try grunting to my impatient, sad son. Okay, so my poem is called Kupin, Russian Empire, 1905. The boy bathes by the creek. By the way, this one I wrote after going to the town in uh, what's now Western Ukraine. Uh, where uh, I'll speak briefly about this. I, I went to this town called Kupin, um, which various members of the family had figured out was where Sam was from. And uh, we always heard of it as like over there, old country, somewhere, Russia, something. But there are two real towns where uh, our dad's parents came from, once in uh, Belarus and once in Ukraine. Um, and his father was from a town that's in Ukraine. And so I went there. And it was an empty little village with goats. Not empty, because there were goats. <laughs> and, there were, and there were geese. And, and there were no people. I was there for a few hours. I think I saw one little boy wandering down a dirt path. It was very strange. Um, and there was a plaque memorializing the Jews who had all been killed there. Um, and I wandered around for a while and took some pictures and then I went to this 
creek in the north side of town, and um, I went swimming. I thought it'd be nice to, you know, freshen up, and I put on a song by my brother, Ethan Bolt, who's here in spirit. Um, and I put it on on the bank of this creek, and I got in the water, and I immediately started crying, and I hadn't, I probably hadn't cried in a decade. I'm one of those men who has trouble. Um, and I started really crying. And I got out of the water, and uh, then I headed back into the nearest city, which is about an hour and a half away. And about 45 minutes later, I finally got reception on my cell phone again, which I hadn't had. And I started getting these messages, bing, 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 from my friend in uh, Kiev, who had been you know, worried about me going to this rural area of Ukraine, and she was, had been researching this little town, and she was like, oh, by the way, when you get to Kupin, you should go visit this creek in the north side of town. That's where they shot all the Jews. So I felt it, obviously, and, and I remember feeling happy that I was able to show my ancestors that we were here and that we had lived. So anyway, this <laughs> that's a big preamble for a short poem, but <laughs> so this poem was born out of that experience. Kupin, Russian Empire, 1905. The boy bathes by the creek, dreaming of faraway girls. Goats peek over bushes, horns first, and then scatter. Sweat tastes good to him, lip sweat, work sweat, America sweat. But he is not American. He is not Russian, not Belarusian, not Ukrainian, not Polish. He is all and none. The goats, his last friends, are long gone. The stiff wool uniforms of the Cossacks look sharp. They take this 12-year-old man, he is a man, and, laughing, lift him, throw him to the water. Now the taste is saltier, sweeter, blood and springtime. They are only playing with an animal, practicing hockey with, a, with batons, hitting a puck, a face, softer than a puck. Later, my grandfather stands, spits, returns to father and mother, says, I am not like you will not live like you, will not die like you. There is gold in the streets of New York, or maybe Cleveland. So that's a pair of poems from the book. Can we do more talking? And do you want to do a, a little more talk and a little more read? Or? Yeah, actually, you can read a little bit. You guys want more conversation? All right, I guess I'll never ask an audience what they want. I feel like I should read a funny poem now after that. There are some funny ones in here. Okay. Well, there's a... Let's see. I didn't think I was going to read one of these. This is I mentioned the... Night dream poems of my dad's. I think I'm going to do one now just to clear <laughs> my sister's. It's like, God, no. <laughs> just, no. Um, maybe, 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 hold on. Maybe I'll, uh, you know what? Uh, maybe I'll skip that one. <laughs> it's, 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 there's nothing gross in it. Nothing gross in it. It's not one of the best poems, but it's just light. It's just, you know, it's like the commercial break. Huh? No apologies. Yes, exactly. No apologies. <laughs> and this nice thing, you know, this book, you can flip around, you can change your tone. Okay. When you're on the John. Um, not that anyone's going to read it on the toilet, right? No, you all will. Okay, it's called Magic Kim, and it's by Herbert Gold. Kim Lister, white-haired dream girl who insisted she was not too young for me. But you are, I protested while still engorged with desires, are you? As I awakened in my inexorable 99th year, which I've been doing regularly these days, but remembering her name from my dream, Kim Lister, Kim Lister, means, does it not, that I'll find her, meet her, treasure her, today, 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 as she convinces me she's not too young, I'm not too old, Kim, 
white haired dream girl, Magic Kimmy. Either you really exist out there on the hill I climb, or the cafe where I order cafe latte, or I'll need to sleep again tonight. He did have me try to find her on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> and I found a couple Kim Listers, actually, and I sent them all to him. Uh, and he kept saying, no, that's not her. <laughs> so let me know if you find her. Um, now I feel like I should just stay in that tone. So, OK, so when he sends that, you know, OK, so my response Hold on a second, I just lost my page number. Uh, go to, uh, yeah, here we go. 2014. I'm reading exactly not the poems I planned to, leave, to read. It's called improvisation, right? Okay, Ode to a Cam Girl, this is mine. <laughs> you know, living, living during lockdown. She poses once, twice again. How many dozens of natural moments, candid moments, has she, not Kim, it could have been Kim, actually. <laughs> Maybe I should have told him this was Kim. Uh, sorry, interrupting my own poem. Uh, how many dozens of natural moments, candid moments, has she sorted through to choose this one, caught by surprise, glance in the mirror, half smile, girl child, sex doll with elf ears? She sends her choice to a dozen known men and a hundred unknown others, face sliced, sliced off at the pouting upper lip, $15 for a natural moment, $15 for intimacies, and then waiting for a Caesar salad to be delivered from evil from the late night Italian chain at her tall window above the colored lights for a single moment, digesting the only bite she'll eat. She is herself, but doesn't even notice. Um, I'd actually like to read about real connection for a second, since those were part of the bigamy chapter. Um, <laughs> there's a chapter called The Spider Plant, and my sisters know very well what that plant is, but I think I can, I think one of the poems explains it, so I'll shut up and just read. So, yes, is this the spider plant mentioned here? Yeah, it is. Here it is, okay. This one is called Melissa, 1943-1991. To remember our marriage, to celebrate our divorce, she sweetly brought me a spider plant. Because they never die, she said. Tendrils green, hanging like dreadlocks. Teasing, as she did when she was happy, angry, or confused. A little notch at the left corner of her mouth. She offered a green gift in a brown pot. It seemed permanent, and she kissed me. She died, but the spider plant gives birth to its shoots. For years now, green, nearly forever. I clip away the crisp brown leaves, and the green feels its chance, takes it forever, it seems, forever. I snip off the spreading brown and water the pot, and green is born overnight, it seems, as if there really is a forever. There was a storm. There was a helicopter. She didn't die, our sons and daughters say. She was killed. Her end is not the same. Her end is always the same. <laughs> but like the spider plant, part two. She's only gone when I wake. When I sleep, she lives in dream, stubborn, immune to time, age, and catastrophe, denying that all who live must die. Yesterday lived last night and again, and then again, more than enough time and too much, until soon enough I will submit, all who live must die until I submit to the truth dream denies. Our children also sleep and will dream when my dreams stop of her holding the lamb chop by the bone, ferocious, teeth bared, delighted, attacking the last bloody shred. Their children will also count the losses 
which are like mine, like yours. The blessings we gain are always lost, but forever present at night in dream, avid, ferocious, teeth bared. She didn't run out her full life before she died. I've lived three acts or four I've tried. It's now we live and then we go. No night, no day, no tomorrow. I thought the time of love would suffice for her, for me, we paid the price. And all our ends are just the end, the same for me and you, my friend. Maybe I'll do one more little, yeah. little, I'd like to read one of Ethan Gold's poems, my brother's. Um, yeah, so my brother was working to cheer up my dad, and so he wrote these five five-word poems. So I'm going to read the five five-word poems. And you see in the book here, so there's a letter from Ethan challenging our dad to connect deeper. And so this is a photo of a photo of a, a letter with this through a microscope we'll be able to get to know our family a little too well. Five five word poems. Once I made a sound. Bark, bark, said two trees. <laughs> Three poets hear the pens. Four directions all bring wind. And finally, this poem has five words. <laughs> um, he also has a poem that I read at a reading down in Los Angeles. Um, I don't need to look it up. It's called Death. It goes like this. That's it. <laughs> but thank you. Thank you for that. And, thank you. Uh, there's a lot going on in this book. Um, and I, I, for me, I, I think that even though he was writing fiction all these years, I think it really kind of built him up. I, I would have loved to have seen more work. I really would have. And I, I think we would have been really surprised. Um, so let's open it up. Um, well, let's see a raise of hands. How many of you actually knew her? Stories, reflections. It takes about a minute, actually, for the uh, one, one part of the brain to connect with the other part of the brain. Ah, here we go. Um, 
uh, I will uh, pass, it, pass it back to Ari. Oops. Uh -oh. uh, what happened? Yep, there you go. Um, should it stay here? Yeah. Um, it's called Other News on page 24. Someone famous will die that day, my day, and the newspaper will report more obituaries on page 24. For the curiosity of some, the regret of several, and the grief of a few. Those few, they matter, so they have a nice walk in the Marin headlands shadowed by a weary and worn mountain, still green, still fragrant, with pine and transplanted eucalyptus, and most important, still there, where I'm proud that the few gather trash, but drop my ashes downwind and remember as I fly away. I will note that the person who, famous person who died that day, is someone that Herb would have very much approved of, Rosalind Carter. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Anyone else? I have a question for Ari. Yeah. So every time I showed our dad anything that I wrote, he would edit it to death. Yeah. Yeah. Right? He couldn't help it. It was a compulsion. Yeah. And even when I gave him my poems, and I said, just read to enjoy them, you know, don't, don't edit. He scribbled all over them, every, every other word, was in that, right? So I want to know if he did that to you. This is going to sound like I'm upselling, but because I have an, a, another book, but I have a novel, actually a memoir, a fictionalized memoir, that he wrote so much on the book that I decided that it was going to become part of the book. And every third chapter is a letter from him saying how my how the main character, who's named Ari, is fucking up his life and makes some different decisions. So that novel is wasn't just infused with his advice with a hammer, but um, you know, it becomes a real part of the story because I, I was sending him this story as a way of trying to, the, the novel was also me trying to say, hey, Dad, this is what I went through, and yes, I'm fictionalizing it, but shit was pretty fucked up. And he kept harassing the character, <laughs> even though it was me. <laughs> I mean, and the pages would be black. Um, so I decided to yeah, include all of that editing in, in the book, which I hope to publish maybe next year or something. But but the poetry, um, I didn't, he did make s a few little suggestions, but maybe because of where he was at the time or um, that I wasn't really having it. You know, I, I think a, a few times he made suggestions that I would keep, but he didn't return them black actually. And I think partially he knew that I was writing them in this very flow, I was writing them in a flow state and maybe he knew better than to try to mess with that. Um, I'm sure he did make some comments. The only thing that I remember, I remember he suggested a title for one of my poems. That was a great title. Um, and uh, I thank him for that, but the the rest of the poetry, I think he pretty much left it alone. Um, the, the the novel, <laughs> not left alone. <laughs> <at all. laughs> because he's donating all his manuscripts to the Bancroft Library at Berkeley. And he did it to himself, too. He had so much editing and rewriting and scribbling and new drafts and revisions and language, you know, playing around with language and titles. Yeah. He did it to himself. 
yourself to. Yeah. yeah. People who are critical are criticizing themselves too. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, a couple of months ago, I was visiting Herb, and in a very solemn moment, he said, I wish I was 97 again. <laughs> Anyone else? Any stories? I have to be some stories. I've got to be some stories. Well, for uh, 20 years and I can remember an article, and uh, one time I was driving a piece about Woody Allen. And I knew that her was sort of coming out with him in the old days. And so I asked him for a story. He said, well, when Woody got to town, the first thing he wanted me to do was to drive him to Berkeley so he could look at the blondes on campus. Jack Sarafati. I first met her when I was 16 years old, freshman at, I guess I was 17 years old, freshman at Cornell at Telluride House, which was kind of an intellectual fraternity. And Herb, I guess he was, Herb was 15 years older than me, so he came down with this, one of these New York supermodels. <laughs> all, all, the, all the undergraduates, you know, was just like, you know, just in awe of, of, of Herb Gold back then. Then I was in his class the, that he, when he placed the boat off his European literature class in 1958 at Cornell. And um, then I met him again in 1964 in Cleveland, because I was, uh, at the time, I, met, I was married to uh, a Cornell girl whose father was a big businessman in Cleveland, Swifties dry cleaning, 144 dry cleaning stores, and we were married in the big Abbott Hill El Silvis thing, and we never heard, we never heard, we met her then, 1964. And then, of course, when, uh, we re reunited again in uh, North Beach for, for many years. And uh, Herb does write about some of this in his book, Bohemia, which uh, I recommend, it's a really good book. Can you talk about the Trieste? Because I know you, I know you. Yeah, yeah. Out there. Yes, yeah. you know, about part of the, the, part of the whole Trieste, yeah. Trieste uh, scene, and some of it there's a. Uh, well, again, Herb's book Bohemia really describes that that period, and there's also uh, a couple of books. There's a book uh, by David Kaiser, How to Help Save Physics, which is set in North Beach, and I think they even quote Herb. He may have an interview for that book. I'm not sure. Uh, thank you. I think we might have time for one more question. They actually want us out of here exactly at five. So. But uh, back here. Hi. I'd like to address this question to all members of Herb's family. Um, I particularly enjoyed when you I enjoyed when you talk about Haiti. And I enjoyed reading The Best Nightmare on Earth. And I'm just curious to know quite simply if your family in later years would accompany him back, or if that was more of his own quest? He was married to his first wife, my mother, when we lived in Haiti. So I grew up there, and then went back. And he did go back with with all, I think all three of you went back at one time or another, right? Yeah. yeah. So it was, I think it was a rites of passage for each of his children to go there. So he took me there when I was maybe 10. It was quite overwhelming, and I was enthralled by all the kittens and kitties <laughs> on the street, and I took a lot of photos, and he ridiculed me pretty much to the end of his life for spending my time in Haiti photographing the kittens. But I thought they were cute. And after that, I became allergic to cats. <laughs> I 
Um, yeah, I was the last one to go to Haiti. Um, you know, I didn't have anything like the experience, especially and having spent years and years there and speaking Creole as a kid. But I heard a lot always about how um, Anne had, had Anne and her sister Judy had had picked up Creole on the streets and, and shocked our dad by by speaking Creole. Um, so I, I eventually went. Um, uh, I think it was in the year 2000, and Ethan had already gone. I think I think Ethan went when he was about 10 or something, and you went when you were nine. And obviously, you had spent, but um, but yeah, I went there as an adult, and he was already there at the Hotel Olufsen. I think he was doing an article, which was usually his excuse for going, or you know, his reason. Uh, excuse, but he was always looking for an excuse to go because he wanted to go. Um, but things had gotten a little bit more difficult in, in Haiti and um, I knew there was a challenge to get uh, to get you know across the city and I, I hired a you know a, a car who and a guy drove me in the back side of the airport to get away from I guess there was a mess and he was trying to get out the back um, to skip the mess and someone decided to roadblock us, a guy with like a military top and, and short shorts um, who didn't want us to go past the road unless we paid him. Um, and then he pulled out a gun and pointed at me and shot it right over my head. Um, and about 20 minutes later, we showed up at the hotel and I was like, wow, I'm welcome to Hades. <laughs> no, I'd never smelled, you know, uh, gunpowder, that clothes, you know, it was, so that, you know, and then I rem he said that he might just slow down his troops to Haiti. <laughs> but then he ended up staying actually a few weeks after he left, so. Yeah. I think we have time for just one more. Story. Please, please do. Thank you. Uh, my name is Stephen Black, and I um, visited Herb a few times uh, and had conversations. Very often we talk about other writers, other poets, and on this occasion I think I was asking about Richard Brodigan, but I got him talking about walking around North Beach with his friend Allen Ginsberg. And uh, just by way of illustration to some point they were making. Uh, a mechanical sound was heard outside the window of the building, I think it was next to a police station. And uh, Ginsburg turned to um, Herb and said, uh, that's probably the sound of poets uh, printing their magazine. This was uh, pre-Xerox, it was during the Mimeo revolution of poetry publications, and that's what um, they assumed that evening was that, yeah, the poets were everywhere, even next to the cop shop, and poetry publications were happening uh, night and day. So anyway, I just thought that was a nice <laughs> evocation of uh, this place we're in. This might have been the 1960s that he was talking about, but still, um, it's, uh, it's part of the genius loci. Thank you. Thank you for that. That's beautiful. Well, OK, we're going to make it quick, because one yeah, yeah, and we will be moving to Ves Vesuvio, remember, Correct. so you can go uh, get a book if you like and then come hang out at Vesuvio, so don't feel like you're getting cut short. My name is Alejandro. I'm uh, Herb's neighbor, a friend for the last couple of years. And, and so a hero. I spoke to guardian a angel. hero, a guardian wait, wait. angel. But Alejandro is, was our dad's guardian angel. Yeah. Good <laughs> I wanted to say, so I, I spoke to him basically every day, you know, passing, uh, had chats and hung out, did errands, chores, things like that. Uh, but for the most part, we just gossiped, talked about fun things. Uh, but one thing I wanted to point out to the children is that um, I only ever heard praise. I only ever heard bragging about your achievements or things that I should go and look up of your work, your books, uh, the volunteer work you're doing, the, the films you've produced. So I just want to let you know that I, I, Parents are difficult. <laughs> you probably have noticed that, uh, but he, he, he loved you.
lovely way to end it, I think. I think we will end it on that note. Uh, but please. I, I want to thank Peter for, for pulling this off. And I'd like to say the, the, the trench coated the trench coated MC is feels very it feels very 1959 city lights. I, I, I like that you're in the trench coat. I just I appreciate this. Style is important. Style is important. Okay, so see you all at, at City Lights and then yeah, Vesuvio. Get a book at City Lights, pop over to Vesuvio's, grab a drink, and uh, we'll all report there. Thank you again for joining us, everyone.